Okay, UConn coming off the Big East regular season championship. So had to have Dave Borges of uh, Connecticut Insider join me. So Dave, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, good to be here, Jared. So I know we, I know we haven't had you on yet this year. So this is a, this is a long time coming this season. Um, excited to have you on. Uh, obviously, coming off the uh, the regular season championship yesterday, probably one of the more impressive goals that this team has had that they were able to accomplish outside of the national championship. I'm curious, just from having followed this team for so long, what impressed you the most about this team? Uh, you know that ultimately led them to this Big East regular season title. Well, there's so much when you consider what they lost last year in the NBA draft. Three, um, well, Adama Sinogo wasn't drafted, but uh, he, you know, he was he was only the final four most most outstanding player. Um, you know, Jordan Hawkins and Andre Jackson Jr. Uh, just to lose those three terrific players and, and be it and, and come together as a team that you could argue is better than they were last year in the sense that they haven't had a prolonged stretch of bad games like they did, like they did last January. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just very impressive. Uh, the depth, the, the, you know, the, the five stars who average double different guys stepping up every night. Cam Spencer only takes only scores five points in the span of 20 seconds. Yes. On Sunday, but, um, and he's done leading. He was entered the game tied as the team's leading scorer, but other guys step up and have big games. It's, it's just there's so many examples of that. Um, you know, and the job Dan Hurley's done as a coach. There, there's a lot to be really impressed with by with UConn this season. Yeah, I, I think when you mentioned that, I mean, I think if you asked Shaheen Holloway yesterday at halftime if you held Alex Caravan and, and Cam Spencer to four points combined, I, you would think he'd be pretty happy. But instead, they were down 15 at that point. So it's kind of crazy. It shows you shows you exactly what you're talking about in terms of anyone being able to contribute. Yeah. Caravan in the last, in UConn's last four games, he's hit exactly one three pointer in each of those games. And he's, he's like four for 20 something. I think he's, he's obviously in a, in a bit of a shooting slump and yet UConn won three of those games um, by an average of 27.3 points. So again, guys can go into slumps, guys can have bad games. Other guys almost always step up. The only games that they've had really kind of only one guy play well, are three of the games of the three games they lost. Uh, yeah. Kansas and, and Creighton, Tristan Newton was kind of the only standout player. And Seton Hall, Donovan Klingon was the only guy really playing well, and then he got injured. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you, it takes a lot of guys having an off night to get to be able to beat UConn. As you follow this team, you know, each game here throughout the season, and you've seen them up close. I, I know you mentioned in those losses that really only one guy was able to, to perform at, at a high level. But as you look at this team and try to find any sort of weaknesses, is there anything that just comes to mind off the bat that you've seen, whether it's in the three losses um, or just as a whole throughout this season? Well, yeah, in those losses, I mean, obviously, you know, the Creighton game, the, the defense just wasn't uh, – the Creighton was on fire. Yeah. And people say, well, you got to look past it. But, you know, UConn could have – obviously could have guarded them better. And, and they didn't. And Stephen Ashworth went off and uh, – the, 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 Creighton hit what 16 three pointers, I think. So, um, things like that, you know, they could, they could, they're a little bit susceptible sometimes defensively in terms of teams driving to the hole. They have some guys who aren't the best one on one defenders. Uh, the, the overall team depth, I just got through saying how what great depth they have. They, they're not quite as deep in terms of uh, eight, nine men deep as they were last year. Um, you know, two freshmen, Jalen Stewart and Solo Ball, have had contributions, uh, here and there throughout the season, but. Um, basically, they're they're more or less a seven man team, um, with uh, you know Stewart kind of being the eighth guy right now. Yeah. Uh, so you know maybe not quite as much depth as last year overall, but um, there's not a whole lot of weaknesses here. Uh, with the the regular season title being locked up, you, you've got two games this week at Marquette at Providence. I, I don't want to say that they're they're meaningless games because because none no game in college basketball is is meaningless per se. But really, you kind kind of locked into to where they are from a a seeding perspective. Obviously, got the the title uh, from the conference wrapped up. Do you see this week at all as a chance to maybe hit on some of that depth that you're talking about, and maybe Jalen Stewart solo ball getting some more minutes this week in hopes of maybe getting them in a bit of a better spot heading into the tournament? Possibly, yeah. Uh, particularly Stewart um, uh, as a guy who can kind of uh, give give Alex Caravan a blow here and there, and and uh, is a, is a nice all around player. Can, you know, um, I think he's obviously jumped up in the rotation. Like I said, sort of the eighth guy right now. Um, 
but you know, Dan Hurley's not going into these games thinking that they're like, you know, intra squad closed door scrimmages or anything like that. He he wants to win them. He knows that if they somehow were to lose the two, and then maybe get popped off, and you know, as unlikely as all this seems, um, maybe get popped off in the Big East tournament in the first or second round, uh, in the quarterfinals or semis, then um, you know. I mean, it's it, it seems unlikely, but perhaps the number one seed is in jeopardy. I doubt that. But, you know, he just wants the team to be playing well going into the the Big East and, of course, the NCAA tournament. So um, I don't know if you're going to see a whole lot more run from those guys. Certainly, if they get comfortable leads and things are going well, then uh, you will see them play more. But uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting because Marquette is down with some injury problems right now. So Wednesday night is going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, and and it, it makes no it's no surprise that the the coach preaching foot on gas up twenty five uh, against Georgetown isn't taking it easy this week uh, with things uh, locked up there. When you look through this team, I think there are so many interesting storylines, and as a beat writer, you get to kind of dive into all of those different storylines. Is there one that stood out to you about this team in particular this season that you've gotten to work on? Yeah, you know it's. Um... There's a lot of different storylines, uh, you know, just looking kind of at the roster. Yeah, I think the job that Dan has done is is a huge storyline. Uh, is he the national coach of the year? I think he's definitely the front runner. I think he probably deserves it. I don't think you can just gloss over the job that um, Lamont Paris has done in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Even the job that uh, uh, Sh- uh, Shamir Abdul-Rahim has done in South Florida. I mean, you know, they've got those guys have those teams playing at very high le- levels, completely unexpected from them this season. Um, and, you know, even Shaheen Holloway, sort of, that'll be interesting to see the Big East coach of the year. I mean, I, I, you'd think it would be Hurley, but um, Shaheen Holloway is t- taking a team that nobody thought much of, picked ninth, and uh, they're going to probably finish fourth in the league um, and probably get an NCAA tournament bid. So, uh, I, yeah, I think the, the job Hurley has done, the way he's balanced, you know, he's the, the, the He's got two potential NBA lottery picks, another third potential first or second round pick in Caravan. Um, that's going to be that's that bears watching too to see how these guys. Um, I don't think these guys are wired to the point where their head's going to be in the NBA during the NCAA tournament. I think you see that with some teams. You've seen that with past UConn teams, but I don't think you're going to see that this year. But that's actually a storyline that um, kind of interesting. You might might bear watching a little bit. Yeah. I, I think one thing that was interesting to me from a, a storyline perspective has been Tristan Newton in, in his role on this team. You know, I think he heard last year constantly that that UConn didn't really have a point guard. And, and I know, you know, Coach Hurley and Tristan certainly took offense to that. La- last night at the uh, at the ceremony after they were, uh, you know, kind of cutting down the nets and stuff, Dan made a point to, to call out Tristan and the job he's done at UConn. It seems like it's just a really interesting relationship between those two from a, a coach player perspective. What have been your thoughts, you know, both on, on Tristan and that relationship between the two there? Yeah. And it's interesting. I wrote about this the other day, um, how the two, the two guys who were are definitely not coming back next year because their eligibility will be exhausted. Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer. Yeah. Have melded so well. And, and, and Cam, you understand that because he's basically Dan Hurley Jr., Dan Hurley playing, you know, is still playing in, uh, uh, on the floor um, personality-wise. And then Tristan's the exact opposite. And he and Dan Hurley, you know, ha- had some friction early on last year. Um, and Dan's admitted that. And even some t- at times this year, there's been a little bit. But Dan, he, I think Tristan's made Dan a better coach, understanding that it takes different personalities for a team to be good. And um, Tristan's obviously learned some stuff, a lot of stuff from from Dan Hurley as well. You think about it, <clears throat> Tristan Newton wasn't even, um, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't wasn't even named uh, to honorable mention for uh, preseason Big yeah. East awards. And I would think right now he's the front runner for the Big East Player of the Year award because, um, you know, what what he's what he's meant to this team. Best leading scorer on the best team, the triple doubles, the clutch performances. Uh, there's some good competition there, but I would say Tristan's probably the Player of the Year. Yeah, it, it, and Dan was quick to call out his role within, or Tristan's role, as one of the better guards we've seen come through UConn. From your time watching this team and following it so closely, how, how does Tristan rank when you kind of look at it from an overall program perspective there? Well, it's it's funny because, like, aesthetically, like, you know, a guy like Shabazz was such just a, such a great shooter, such a clutch shooter, yeah. um, great, great distributor. Um 
you know, Kemba, of course, was as clutch as they get, developed into an excellent shooter uh, when he wasn't really at, at first at UConn. Um, and obviously those guys uh, have the national championship. Sabaz has two. Um, Tristan has one. Tristan, you know, he's not a great shooter. He, he's, he's a good shooter. He's shooting 32% from three this year. He hits some big buckets and he can get hot like anyone. Um, you know, aesthetically, he's not, he maybe isn't quite as smooth as some of those guys. But when you look at the numbers, he's UConn's leading scorer. He's also their leading rebounder, <laughs> which is both a good or a bad thing. Uh, and uh, obviously their best distributor by far. So um, when you look at the overall numbers, you add the fact that he's a national champion, was a, not, was a Final Four um, all-tournament pick last year, um, good chance of being Big East Player of the Year this year. He's going to be as decorated as almost any UConn guard ever. So as, and for, as far as the guards I've seen, he'll be as decorated as, as Kemba and Shabazz and maybe even more so. So um, he's right up there, man, and it's just been in two years, too. I'm going to take a quick break from the interview to tell you about my friends at Martin Rosol's Meats. This fourth-generation Connecticut family business produces kielbasa, hot dogs, sausages, and deli meats using Martin Rosol's very own original recipes. Their products can be found in grocery stores, delis, restaurants, and hot dog stands throughout the state. And if you're looking for your fill right away, check out their retail store in New Britain. For more information, visit martinrosolsinc.com and go support a UConn fan-owned business. And now, back to the interview. Yeah, it's it's crazy what he's been able to do in, in just a couple of years here. Um, another storyline that was interesting to me, and I think coming off the the game against Seton Hall has a little bit more pop to it too. Is Steph Castle? You don't you don't see many one and dones come through UConn uh, through the program. They they really have never built that way. But you got a guy like him. You're able to see. You, you've seen flashes throughout the year of, of what he's been able to do. You know, maybe a couple games here or there. But I feel like yesterday was one of those first games where he he really had put it all together. Um, your thoughts on him throughout this season and then what you're kind of expecting from him heading into the postseason? Yeah, I think, you know, early on, he battled some injuries. Um, he was he missed some games. And then coming back, it took him a while to kind of get back in the groove. Um, and you, sometimes you sat there and said, this guy's, this guy's a projected lottery pick. Um, he knew he was a freshman playing in a very, in a very veteran league, a very veteran uh entire NCAA, I mean, with, with, the, with the COVID seniors and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's an old man's game right now in college basketball. And certainly the Big East is an old man's league. Um, so, yeah, he, and he's not – he's also, you know, certainly needs to improve as a, as a three-point shooter. But, yeah, Sunday against Seton Hall, he put it all together. And, and what impressed me the most – well, for, you know, it's just some, you know, the defensive job he did at Kadari Richmond in the first half, holding him to one for eight shooting. Um, for the most part, he, he guarded him most of his first half. Um, but just the 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 overall athleticism kind of caught me by surprise. I knew he was a good athlete, and we've seen it. But what he ended up with four or five dunks, yeah, uh, spectacular plays in traffic at times. Um, it, it makes you realize that that injury probably did slow him down for a good portion of the early part of the season. And now that he's really a hundred percent and and kind of a a veteran as a freshman almost, um, you're seeing the real Steph Castle, and it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I, I know what, what you've seen from him. Uh, th some of those dunks uh, on Sunday were truly fantastic. Some of the better dunks we've seen at Campo in a while. So uh, certainly brings a, a, a different element to this team. Um, another guy just to, to talk about with you as we're going through some of these storylines, because this UConn team was a very different team with and without Donovan Klingon playing. Uh, your thoughts on, on what you've seen from Donovan this year. Another interesting storyline to, you know, being a Connecticut kid, deciding to come back this year um, and really having a, a spectacular season and, and a big impact when he's in the game. Yeah. Yeah. He, an, he, another example of a guy who was injured at one point this year and uh, missed some games and then, came back and, um, uh, you know, took a little while to get the rust off. And now that rust is off, and he's just been excellent lately. Um, terrific game on Sunday, blocked five shots, uh, 19 points, 11 rebounds, I think it was. Um, pretty um, pretty unstoppable. Uh, not getting in foul trouble. He's being a little more judicious and smart defensively. Um, I don't think he's been in foul trouble the last few games, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's, a, and that's a big thing, improving his foul shooting, which is, which is also a big thing for him. Uh, I never quite understood why his percentage had been so low. He looks like he's got a nice, good form, smooth shot, but he wasn't, he was a, like a 50% foul shooter for a while. 
this season. He's only up to 56.4% right now, but he's been hitting him better at a better rate lately. And yeah, yeah and, I, and like you said, the, the defensively, everything changes when he's in there. He's such a presence. Even the shots he doesn't block, um, he alters. He, he he has people are, he's in the back of shooters' minds. So he, he makes a huge, huge difference for UConn. Yeah, I, I, I think one thing that's been impressive to me about this UConn team is how they've been able to adjust when these guys have been injured. You, you know, you mentioned Donovan and Steph both battling injuries. How, how, did, how impressive is that to you to see a team be able to kind of have to adjust on the fly, especially with a guy like Donovan, who a lot of things are centered around, to have been able to play through stretches without those guys and, and not necessarily look like they've missed much of a beat there? Yeah, they didn't lose a game without Donovan, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think they lost they lost Kansas the Kansas game without um without Steph, Steph Castle. But um yeah, uh, I guess you could say they, they didn't have Donovan for the end of the Seton Hall, the last second half of the Seton Hall game. But um it's been impressive. Again, that's that's the, the depth, which length wise, maybe not quite as much, but just talent wise, it's they've got seven real strong contributors that can uh, step in. Like Samson Johnson played pretty well in Donovan's absence and they 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 and they and they just on the fly and and, and they had Alex Caravan played the five at times. Um, uh, and Steph Castle and, and Jalen Stewart have kind of played the five at times, or at least guarded the other opposing big man uh, when 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 Kling was out or when Klingon and Johnson were in foul trouble, things like that. Yeah, it just shows what a, what an all around team this is. Um, but you know, I will say that by and large, you look around. I mean, obviously Marquette right now with Tyler Kolick, uh, Houston has, is really banged up. UConn um, injuries really. Aren't, excuse, aren't an excuse for UConn this year. I mean, they, you know, I don't want to jinx it for them, but they've been uh, pretty pretty lucky with health the last two years, to be honest with you. And I know they've had some guys miss some, a little bit of time here and there, but by and large, they've been pretty lucky with health. Yeah. As you look down the, the last week here of the regular season, even looking into the, you know, the Big East tournament next week, you're looking to see some improvement uh, from UConn in an area or two. Is there anything that comes to mind that they're kind of, you think there's kind of a focus these last couple of weeks? Uh, I just think, you know, there's a lot of little things. I mean, um, you know, you get back to free throw shooting that that's been a little bit less than you'd expect, especially from the big men, big men, both Donovan and Samson this year. Um, Yeah. I think, uh, you know, well, I think I do think that maybe getting that eighth guy, maybe getting Jalen Stewart a little more involved could be big um, for them. Um, but um, you know, just it, it, I think it's just main the, the main thing is just kind of to keep focused on on the on the, the grand prize because we saw what happened when uh, and whatever you want to say in terms of tough schedule that week to travel out to Omaha, but we saw what happened when they maybe lost focus a little bit at Creighton. They got they got blitzed by 19 points. So um they uh just it's just a matter of remaining focused and, and I, I just with this team, with this coach, I don't see that being an issue. But uh Dan will make sure he will pound that home over these next uh several weeks. You've seen all these biggest big east teams uh up and close. Uh if you had to pick someone outside of UConn heading into MSG next week, and, and maybe even someone outside of the kind of the big three there, who, who do you have circled as possible spoiler there? Well, I'd watch out. Well, I really thought Marquette um was coming along as a really, really elite final four team. Uh, because Cam Jones, who was a very good, has been a very good player for them. He's he's really stepped up huge recently with a couple thirty four point games. Kolek's injury, you know, depending on the severity of it, that might throw a monkey wrench into their success. You know, hopefully for him and them, he's okay and he'll be able to play at the same level. Because even last year in the tournament, he was banged up, and even though he played, it, it certainly didn't help them. I would say, um, you know, I, I watch out for St. John's. They're playing better. They seem like they um, they gotten over that controversy when Rick Pitino said some so a few of the many bizarre things he've said this he said this season um but he's a great coach and we you know and can deny that you know it's the, the Big East tournament's obviously on their home floor uh and let's let's face it if they face UConn in the Big East tournament I'm not saying they're going to have a home court advantage because there'll be plenty of UConn fans there maybe even more than St. John's but you're asking Dan Hurley a great coach and the Cuskies to beat Rick Pitino not three times, but four times in the span of a calendar year. That's pretty tough to do. Um, Cause don't forget they beat him at Iona last March. Right. So, uh, you know, 
And of course they can do it and they probably will, but I, watch out for St. John's a little bit uh, next week in, in, in Manhattan. Do you have a prediction on how many of these uh, Big East bubble teams end up uh, making it into the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I haven't had taken a deep dive, but I mean, I, I feel like they'll get five. I mean, I think Seton Hall, despite the, uh, not a great net ranking and obviously being blown out the last couple of games by the two of the best teams in the, in the league on the road, um, I think you, I think they're an NCAA tournament team. And then I think uh, St. John's has an easy final two games against the Paul and Georgetown, I believe. And Providence, um, tough, crippling loss to Villanova, but um, still has a chance. I mean, certainly that game against UConn could be big for them. Yeah. So um, I think they get, um, you know, the big three, UConn, Marquette, Creighton, Seton Hall, and then, you know, and Villanova too. Uh, you know, it's, 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 and they're playing better. Um, two of those three, I, I'd say, will get in and most likely get in. So I, I would think five, yeah, uh, six might be a stretch. No, I think that I think that's fair. Um, when it comes to predictions to this time of the year, uh, always looking at the the conference uh, all tournament teams. Uh, how many UConn guys do you think can make this all Big East first team? Because it, it, it's a lot. It's tough competition. It's going to be fascinating because they're almost a victim of their own uh, depth or. Yeah. or uh, you know, variety of, of scoring. And, um, you know, I think Tristan Newton's a lock for first team. Um, now, no, no, Cam Spencer, is he a first teamer? He should be. But you, you look you look at Creighton, they got three guys who are des deserving a first team. And now I don't think they'll get three, but I think they'll probably get two. Um, you know, Kolick, obviously, Devin Carter and Providence. It's going to be tough. It's going to be interesting. You know, UConn fans are... We'll find something to be upset about uh, when the when the Big East awards come out because um, they might only get one first teamer, and if they do get two, maybe a caravan gets left off completely. Or um, you know, I don't know if Klingon uh, Klingon could still end up somewhere there, but maybe not. Um, I think they're going to clean up on the individual awards, but then again, if if God forbid Hurley doesn't win Coach of the Year or Tristan doesn't win Player of the Year, um, that'll be interesting. And um, I think one thing we do know is that Steph Castle will be the uh, freshman of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one's uh, as much of a lock as, as they come here. Um, I've got to wrap with this one. You mentioned UConn fans always finding something to get uh, a little bent out of shape about there. Uh, we talked a little bit last year about the uh, AP top 25 being a voter there. Fan base is having some fun with that. H how were things this year? Uh, any better, any worse? Uh Let's just say I'm not particularly popular in a few states, uh, Wisconsin being one of them. Um, the Auburn Auburn fans uh, don't don't particularly care for me these days, and a uh, couple of others. You know, it's it's it's, I'm, which I'm fine with. I mean, you know, people people can blast me on on social media. I mean, that's not the real world anyway. But uh, you know, it, you're gonna get that. You have to have thick skin, and you know, you're not gonna get everything right necessarily either. But um, you just go with what you think is the best. And uh, I have a different outlook on some things. I don't necessarily look at the net as, as gospel or, or any of the metrics as gospel. Like I think some voters do. I like to reward a team like South Carolina or South Florida. Uh, I think I have them 10th and 16th respectively this week, which is probably higher than most. And uh, meanwhile, I dropped Kansas all the way down to 24, which may not make me popular in Kansas this week either. So, uh, but, you know, as a voter, you have to just vote. You have to go with what you think, and you can't be influenced by what people on social media are going to say about it. Because um, then, why even vote? You know, right. and just you know, just copy everybody else's top twenty-five and just uh, be un uncontroversial. I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm just trying to be honest. And sometimes honesty, uh, you know, isn't the most popular thing. Yeah. Well, well, Dave, I really appreciate the time coming on. Uh, looking back at this regular season here, talking a little bit into the future here, and uh, I think it's going to be fun. Uh, last month or so here. So thanks so much for coming on and uh, appreciate the coverage you do. All right, man. Thanks a lot, Jared. Good talking to you.